speaking. I'm Dr. Mitra and I would be your instructor for Elysium 4560 Transportation Management. Before we get started with the presentation, uh, I would like to let you know that getting yourself familiar with the syllabus, especially the schedule, the due dates for the quizzes and the exam is very important. So do spend some time reading the syllabus. If you need any clarification, feel free to uh, reach me through my email or stop by my office during my office hours. So let us get started with this chapter one, transportation critical link in the supply chain. In this chapter, we'll look into the role of transportation in supply chain in general. Uh, if you look into the figure, you will see that you have the raw material sources, the suppliers, manufacturers, uh, customers, and the consumers. They are all physically separated from one another. Transportation is the link uh, between these different players in the supply chain. So transportation is also called the glue in the supply chain. It helps to uh, move things from one player in the supply chain to the next. So we'll look into different aspects of transportation and what role it plays in the supply chain. Economics of transportation. Now, the available transportation infrastructure available public transit, available uh, trucks for freight movement. These all affect our life. It affects the way industries are developed in a region. Uh, it affects uh, how companies relocate from one location to another. Now like other economic factors Transportation is also not an unmixed blessing. Um, there are a lot of safety issues which are related with transportation. There are a lot of environment issues which are related with transportation. So we will look into uh, those different aspects as well in uh, future chapters which we'll be covering in this course. Regions or areas tend to specialize in the production of certain goods or services. Say for example, um, in the state of Wisconsin, there are a lot of factories producing furnitures. So there is a cluster for that particular product. But the demand for furnitures are not within Wisconsin. It is scattered throughout U.S. So there is a gap between the production point and the consumption point. And transportation is uh, that service which bridges that gap. Now if you look at the figure over here, we see that forest, we see those uh, primary processing, secondary processing and the end product. So each of those at different locations. Okay. And the other thing is like when there is a processing plant, there will be other processing plant and other ancillary industries around that location and that forms the cluster. But the end user, they are not close to that cluster, they are scattered all around. And that the demand for the product created, creates the demand for transportation. So it has to move from the point of production to the point of consumption. Transport measure, measurement units. Now, we measure transportation by different uh, units. One of them is ton mile, the other is passenger mile. Ton mile is mostly used for measuring uh, movement of freight, like how many tons of freight are moved for how many miles. Say, for example, a 20-ton tr 
freight which is moved maybe in SMI is moved for 5 miles so that will generate 100 ton mile so the 20 multiplied by 5 that's 100 it's 100 ton mile on the other hand for passenger miles um, say if you have a public transit say a uh, light rail which which is moving say 100 passengers for so five miles so it would be 100 into 5 so 500 passenger mile so that's the output so these are the different ways we measure output like now you ha you might have the question like what why is it required it is required so we can know the productivity of each of those units like product you have you are working in a trucking company and you want to know what's the what's the productivity of your company in a year particular year so you can use ton mile to measure the productivity on the other hand say you are working in dart the dark transit and you want to know how many passengers you are moving for how many miles so you might use this unit passenger mile to estimate your productivity now we can aggregate the these measurements based on freight or based on passengers as we have discussed like for freight you are using ton mile for passengers you are using passenger miles you can use the production the the transportation measurement unit for modes <coughs> for mode share like the freight how much of that is moved by train how much is moved by truck how much may be moved by um, air cargo so there can be different modes and how much each of those modes are carrying you can use the measurement to understand or aggregate the market share now we have talked about the trucking mode the trucking mode is again comprised of hundreds of trucking companies now if you want to know the market share of each of those companies you can use any of these measures like the ton mile to say that mm, based on the ton mile measurement company XYZ is having 10% share of total uh, uh, total trucks operating in United States or 10% of the trucking mode so th that's huge so 10% of um, that the trucking mode is a h huge amount so that would be a tremendously big company a national company so these units are measured are used to uh, understand the productivity they're used to aggregate mm, the label of measurement for each of those modes in the previous slide we talked about aggregation of measurement by modes and in this table we have looked into uh, the different modes for passenger transportation and the mode for measurement is passenger miles as we have discussed in the previous slide now over here we see that we have basically looked into four different modes like air bus rail and auto mm. in 1990 um, we see that auto is having the biggest share is by far much bigger than some of air bus and rail uh, in 2006 uh, still auto is the biggest share but what we see that there has been growth of all these different modes but the growth, growth for the year mode is probably the biggest now compared to year bus and rail uh, which are basically public transits which which are which are not owned by individuals like among those three modes air transportation has got the biggest share and one justification would be uh, that air transportation um, the, the the mileage there is much bigger 
if, if you remember uh, what we talked about in the last slide, passenger mile, that stands for number of passengers moved, multiplied by the number of miles they have moved. So it is, in, it is intuitive that here transportation, the, the passengers are moved for a uh, longer distance. So obviously the passenger mile, that amount would be bigger uh, than bus and rail. Uh, in US compared to many other countries the share for rail is much less than even bus and air. Now in this slide we are looking into uh, the freight town movement. Uh, in the previous previous slide we had been talking about passenger miles uh, that was the unit of measurement. In this slide Ton mile is the unit of measurement, and this is used for uh, aggregating freight movement by different modes. Now, the different modes which we see over here are air, truck, rail, water, and pipeline. Uh, starting from 1990 to 2006, what we see that hmm, the air has got a very low percentage. If you um, if you calculate the percentage, uh, it would be really low compared to other modes like truck, rail, water, or even pipeline. Uh, the pipeline mode, which we are not uh, that much conversant, we, because we don't see that much of movement of freight through pipeline, but that is much bigger compared to uh, air cargo freight. But what we see that the air cargo has grown uh, almost 50% from 1990 to 2006. Uh, compared to truck and rail, rail is bigger. Uh, again, you should understand the unit is ton mile. Number of tons moved multiplied by the number of miles. Uh, if you see other statistics, uh, you'll find that the total tons moved by truck is more than that of rail. But because rail move freight for a longer distance, the ton mile becomes bigger. Uh, again, uh, if you look at this table, you can see the growth of these two modes, two very important modes, truck and rail, how it has happened in the last uh, 10 to 15 years from 1990 to 2006. Price elasticity of demand. This measures, this, this is a concept from economics and this measures the percentage change in demand for certain percentage change in price. Uh, if, you, if you take the math part of that, if you, uh, we, we have the percentage change in demand in the numerator and the percentage change in price in the denominator. Uh, if you look at the figure here, uh, we have we plot price on the y-axis and the demand or the quantity demanded on the x-axis. The price changes uh, from P old to P, P new. When the price was P old, the quantity demanded was Q old. When the price changes to P new, the price is increasing by 1%, the quantity demanded decreases by two percent. Uh, so if you if you go back to that uh, the numerator and the denominator aspect of that formula, uh, we see that on the denominator we have two, and the, in the numerator we have one. Uh, in the the numerator which talks about the percentage change in demand, we see from this figure it is two. So and and in the denominator we have one. So we would say that this particular commodity or this particular service is price elastic because the change in demand is more than the change in price. On the flip side of it, uh, if you had a situation where we had the price which is increasing say by 2% and the demand changes by 1%, we would say it is price inelastic. The previous example was for price elastic uh, now, 
when we look into the transportation, we see that there are certain modes of transportation which are more price elastic than another. Uh, by price elastic, we mean that if the price rises, probably we, we move over to some other mode of transport. Mm, we, we can say that mm, the truck is more price elastic than rail. Again, we, we have to look in more details into uh, this elasticity aspect in uh, future slides. As we have seen in the previous slide, that if the percentage change in quantity is less than the percentage change in price, then uh, that commodity is inelastic or insensitive to price change. On the other hand, if the percentage change in quantity or percentage change in demand is more than the percentage change in price, then that demand is price elastic or it is sensitive to price change. If you look at the figure here, uh, we are plotting quantity demanded uh, on the x-axis and the price on the y-axis. If you see that uh, the vertical line which shows it is perfectly inelastic, uh, by that we mean that even if the price changes, the, the quantity demanded doesn't change. So, um, it justifies that it is perfectly inelastic. It doesn't change with the change in price. On the other hand, if you see that horizontal line and which shows that perfectly elastic, uh, again, these, these two are both two extremes. For the perfectly elastic, we mean that if the price changes by a very small amount, the, the quantity demanded changes drastically. So that's perfectly elastic. Uh, the, the curve line which we see, this is again a convex curve line, which we see is somewhere in between perfectly elastic and perfectly inelastic. Uh, and again, we can, we can use the justification which we have given, um, which we have talked initially, that if the change in percentage of quantity is more, then the change in price, it, it is uh, elastic. On the other hand, if the percentage change in quantity is less than price, then it is inelastic. Now, price elasticity of demand, uh, this is some uh, continuation from the previous slides, whatever we have discussed there. Uh, if you take uh, uh, freight transportation as such, uh, it is uh, less price inas elastic. Uh, I'll try to explain that. Like freight transportation can be done in different modes, say rail, by truck, by here, by pipeline. So if you take uh, summation of all this uh, freight demand or freight transportation, uh, then the then the this demand for transportation is inelastic because if the price rises for one mode it probably ships to some other mode but overall the total demand for transportation st uh, remains constant because goods cannot stop moving even if the price rises so uh, if you take the example of uh, increase of mm, the gasoline price mm, what we have seen that even if the the cost for transportation is increased because of the uh, increase of the fuel price, uh, the transportation demand haven't really dipped to that extent. The total transportation demand it might move from truck to rail because rail is a cheaper uh, means of transportation and it is more fuel economic. Uh, but the total summation haven't changed. But on the other hand, if we look into the, the elasticity of demand for each individual modes, then we will see that it is price elastic. That's because if the price for one particular mode increases, 
the demand for transportation would be moving to some other mode if the if the cost of transportation per mile for the truck mode increases the goods would be moving eventually to railroad and also if the opposite happens if the cost for railroad increases it would move from railroad to truck so individual modes are more price elastic but aggregate it's less elastic that's because um, they, there is movement in between two different modes but on the whole it doesn't change that much uh, I'll explain the concept of derived demand transportation demand is called derived demand because transportation as such sati doesn't satisfy our demand we have demand say for furnitures and furnitures are to be moved from the retail store to our home so because of our demand for furniture the de the demand for transportation was generated uh, if you take another example that um, if you take some agricultural freight production they are to be moved from the farm to uh, the processing plant the processing plant has got a demand for those raw material but because of the demand for raw material they create a demand for transportation and it can be in any mode it can be in rail it can be in truck or whatever mode possible so uh, as a as a student for, of log logistics and transportation uh, we always try to understand that the demand for transportation exists because there is a demand for movement of goods if we take the example of passenger movement uh, it's also a derived demand say you have the demand from come to your residence to our campus uh, so there is a demand for your movement to come to campus and that generates the demand for transportation that you will drive your vehicle and come to uh, even to Dallas so because there exists a demand for freight movement because there exists a demand for person movement from point A to point B the derived demand of transportation is created Uh, this figure tries to explain the concept of derived demand um, City A produces widgets and uh, City B and C they are the consumer locations now City C doesn't have any demand for widgets and the City B is having some demand for widgets because of the demand for widgets the demand for transportation is created the uh, from city A to city B there is a demand of a uh, hundred transportation by hundred transportation it's basically movement of those hundred pieces of widgets from city A to city B uh, but on the route between city A and city C because there is no demand for widgets uh, the transportation demand is zero so this explains the concept of derived demand so the demand for transportation comes afterwards first there has to be some demand for movement of goods in this slide we'll look into the concept of landed cost uh, landed cost is the production is the is a summation of the production cost and the transportation cost say there is a manufacturer in Chicago uh, he produces commodity A which is to be moved to Dallas uh, so the the landed cost would be the production cost in uh, Chicago plus the transportation cost between Chicago and Dallas and that determines what is the final price the consumer is going to pay um, there is a uh, uh, the Leibniz law which says that uh, if this uh, if the landed cost is low uh, the extent uh, 
to which a producer can reach the market is would be higher. Uh, I think that makes sense that uh, the pro again we'll go back to that example which we just uh, discussed. There is a manufacturer in Chicago. Uh, if he can move his goods at a lower cost, he can reach the East Coast and the West Coast. So lower is the transportation cost, the bigger would be the reach of the manufacturer. On the other hand, if uh, say the transportation cost increases because of the increase in the fuel price, uh, the extent to which the manufacturer can reach will decrease because the because of the transportation cost increase, the the landed cost in, uh, increases and that will decrease the extent or the range of a producer's market. Uh, this figure explains a simple uh, co the, the concept of landed cost. Uh, we have manufacturers in Chicago and manufacturers in Boston. Now the price for production in Chicago is $3 and the price in Boston is $4. The manufacturer in Chicago would be able to capture the market in Boston uh, only if uh, they can move their only if the the landed cost is four dollars in Boston and that is possible only if the transportation cost is one dollar. Uh, so it makes sense that the consumers would be ready to buy uh, from the manufacturer in Chicago only if they can provide the goods at least at the same price which uh, the producer in Boston is able to provide. Uh, there is one assumption again. The assumption is both goods uh, the goods produced at the two locations are of the same quality and same specification. So this explains again the concept of landed cost. Uh, so that $3 cost of production plus $1 cost of transportation uh, makes the landed cost $4 for the producer in Chicago for a market in Boston. Uh, this figure, uh, which is again from your text, tries to explain the reach of producer based on the concept of landed cost. There are two producers, one at P and one at S. Uh, the transportation cost for the producer at P is 60 cents per unit per mile. For the producer at S, the transportation cost is 50 cents per unit per mile. So you have to do a little math to find out the location where the landed cost of goods produced by these two manufacturers would be same. For example, say you find a point uh, somewhere uh, which is at a distance x from the producer p. Okay, in that case, uh, let me take some other pen. So, in that case, uh, x multiplied by 0.6 would be equal to 200 minus x multiplied by 0 0.5. Uh, excuse me for this sloppy handwriting. I'm trying to write using the mouse and I'm not really that good in it. If you solve this, you'll get that x is equal to 90.9. Now again x is the distance from point P to that location where the landed cost for the two manufacturers would be same.
So just try to think about this problem. So uh, it is more towards the producer P or the reach of the producer P is less than the that of the producer in location is that's because his transportation cost is higher so as we have discussed previously if your transportation cost is low your reach would be longer that's because your landed cost would be lower compared to another manufacturer whose transportation cost is higher so if you think this from a uh, supply chain perspective or uh, the competition perspective competition in the market perspective that manufacturer would be successful who can use that mode of transportation uh, which is cheaper uh, that manufacturer would be successful if he can buy things which are um, which are bought into his factory at a lower cost so that he can make things at a cheaper cost. So this concept can be utilized in uh, transportation. This concept can be used in supply chain. This can be used in marketing. The concept of landed cost. Okay, so in this slide we'll look into different service components of freight demand. Uh, now, the different components of uh, freight, freight movement, which affect supply chain. Uh, one of them is, uh, let me get a pen from here, or maybe a highlighter. One of them would be the transit time. Uh, the transit time is the is the time from uh, an the order is placed and when the delivery is done that is the transit time so it, it can be say you place an order for an item uh, online and it takes seven days for that uh, item to be delivered at home so that would that is your transit time that seven days uh, the next would be again that transit time is determined by the transportation the speed of transportation the mode of transportation used and the cost you are paying for the transportation uh, next would be the reliability uh, the reliability is a little different from the transit time as we said that you place an order and it takes you and it takes that particular um, item to be delivered um, uh, that the time required is uh, seven days but reliability tells whether that seven days remains constant or it changes now uh, that's important because uh, if you're if you're not certain about that seven days time period you probably have to order uh, 10 days prior to your requirement so that you don't go out of stock say if you take the case of a retail store uh, he orders his supplies to be delivered and uh, normally it takes seven days uh, from the manufacturer uh, to supply the goods to the retailer uh, if the reliability is low in that case the retailer probably would be having more safety stock to um, stop being uh, out of stock for a certain length of time um, that's the delay in the delivery so that's reliability next would be accessibility um, whether the transportation service is accessible or not whether you have that service, whether you need that or not, whether it can be used to deliver goods at every location of US or um, whether it can be used to buy things from some other part of the world. So that is accessibility. Next, capacity. Mm, capacity comes more when uh, you want a specific commodity which is really huge and it's uh, uh, it's more than or it's it's in a such a shape that it cannot be fit in a box which can be loaded in a truck say a energy manufacturing company who uses those uh, mm, the wind energy they use they need huge blades for those wind vents uh, and 
the capacity of the transportation uh, is important because whether it would be able to carry that particular product and get it delivered at the location so that's capacity and of course security like when the goods are in transit how much security do you uh, have like uh, or can you guarantee for those products to be delivered safe uh, without being uh, without there being any pilferage or theft uh, without loss of any quality uh, without uh, for the delay or getting stuck at certain point so these are different aspects of security again transit time reliability accessibility capacity security these are different um, characteristics of transportation and which becomes vital in a supply chain uh, because supply chain profitability would be affected by these uh, fa transportation factors big way We have seen that uh, the transportation and economic activities are historically linked with one another. Cities have grown up where transportation um, facilities were available. Um, and again, transportation has grown in those cities where there, there is a lot of economic activities. Uh, if, you, if you take uh, many of the older cities, uh, the transportation and economic activity both have worked hand in hand for the development of those cities. Um, again, a lot of companies who have become global, they try to uh, locate their production point where the transportation uh, facilities for, or global transportation facilities are available. The other aspect which we should understand is uh, this demand for transportation is dynamic. Uh, if the economic activities changes, the transportation demand will also change. It can, uh, the economic activity can increase, which will increase the demand for transportation. On the other hand, the economic activities can decrease and the demand for transportation fades away. Take the example of the, the oil exploration in North Dakota, which is happening now, uh, or by now I mean maybe last 10 years or so, uh, that has, uh, influence the demand for transportation of oil from North Dakota to uh, to the end users or refineries. So that has boosted the, the demand for transportation. Um, so these are there are a lot of examples which basically explain how this economic activities and transportation they're linked with one another and how uh, they're dynamic. If you take the example of South Dallas, um, South Dallas is a logistics hub. By South Dallas, I mean uh, uh, the, the cities uh, which are located adjoining Dallas City, like Lancaster, uh, Cedar Hill, DeSoto, uh, Wilmer. These are the cities where transportation is a, uh, plays a very predominant role. Now, because of availability of transportation, the economic activities are increasing. And because of the increasing increase of economic activities, the transportation demand also increases. So they work hand in hand. Now we'll look into different supply chain concepts as developed over time. In the 1960s, we had the physical distribution concept. Then in 80s came the business logistics concept. In the 90s, we have seen the supply chain management concept. So uh, this is the chronological order in which the different concepts of mm, movement of goods have evolved. So let us look into uh, each one of these. Physical distribution concept. So this was the very first concept of goods movement and uh, the basic concern for the manufacturers was to move the goods out of production. So once the goods were produced, they had to be moved out to the consumers um, or the retailers or the distributors. Uh, and if you have the concept of supply chain, this movement 
out of the distribution center is called the outbound logistics. So the physical distribution concept is tied to outbound logistics. The business logistics concept. So after the concept of physical distribution uh, came the concept of business logistics in which uh, the manufacturers and business units started understanding that that it is not only the outbound logistics which is important but also the inbound logistics is important that is uh, the movement of raw material from the different suppliers m the movement of semi-finished goods from different suppliers so that's the inbound part of logistics and the business logistics con concept includes this inbound logistics along with the outbound logistics and in 1990s came the uh, supply chain management concept when we uh, took into uh, account all the different flows the inbound the outbound the flow of products flow of information and the flow of cash so if we look this from the transportation perspective in the physical distribution perspective the outbound logistics which included the movement of trucks out of factories that is where the main uh, focus was now more and more uh, with the passage of time the company started understanding the importance of inbound logistics so the transportation component of the inbound became important and finally in the supply chain concept both the movement of goods which is basically the movement of freight uh, from the suppliers to the manufacturers and from the manufacturers downstream to the distributors and retailers so that's that's part of the supply chain concept at the same time it included the flow of information it included flow of funds from downstream to upstream so this figure basically talks about all those three movements uh, the products which move from upstream to downstream information which moves in both direction and the finance which moves from downstream to upstream but if you look at those arrows we'll see that arrows are pointing in both direction how is that possible that's possible because for the product when there is a return of goods it moves upstream from the consumers back to the manufacturers and back to the suppliers and when there is a reverse logistics the the fund which is the the consumers get back the the money what they have paid so the fund is moving again in the opposite direction from upstream to downstream the information flow uh, presently supply chain is driven by information flow information flow is triggered by any activity along the supply chain it can be a, a consumer going at a retail store buying a product scanning the product and uh, moving out of the retail store it can be the movement of truck from a distributor to a retailer it can be uh, the delivery of raw material or semi-finished goods from a supplier to a manufacturer so all these different components of supply chain uh, generate a piece of information and uh, the flow of information is what uh, drives the supply chain now uh, if there if the movement is seamless if the movement of information from one player of the supply chain to the other is seamless then the efficiency of the supply chain increases on the other hand if the if there is a uh, break in the movement of information the supply chain loses the efficiency uh, a 
example of inefficient supply chain would be the bullwhip effect uh, so let me take grab a pen here okay so this bullwhip effect is what I was talking about this is an example of inefficient supply chain when there is a uh, information lag uh, flow of information lag uh, between uh, different players of the supply chain and this causes inventories to pile up at different points in the supply chain again we, we will look into this uh, in some of the chapter in further details uh, so we understand that the supply chain is concept is uh, is driven by information but the faster the information flows it becomes the burden of transportation to move goods faster uh, and deliver it at the right time at the right place just imagine you going to uh, or ordering a goods over Amazon how much time does it take maybe a few minutes that's all but unless the goods are delivered unless there is a transportation of goods from the distribution center to your location the uh, the ordering process is not fulfilled so however fast the information flow is the transportation uh, has to be uh, developed in tandem uh, and unless that is done the efficiency of the system is not achieved Uh, this slide talks about the cash flow the cash flows uh, in normal transaction by normal transaction I, I mean when consumers go and buy goods uh, he pays to the retailers the retailer pays their distributors the distributors uh, may be paying the producers the producers are paying the suppliers so we see that the movement of dollar takes place from downstream that is from the retailers end to upstream uh, which is the supplier so this is the general pattern of flow of cash or flow of uh, finance but uh, it's not restricted within that we also have seen that the the cash flow can happen in the other direction and that happens when there is uh, a return of goods and that's called reverse logistics when goods are returned it moves upstream and the cash flows downstream okay so the chapter the chapter one ends here uh, I think that I had given you an overall understanding of the importance of transportation in supply chain management uh, so Please go through the chapter, go through the text. If you have any uh, problem in understanding any particular concept in this chapter, feel free to send me an email. Uh, or if required, you can come over to my office to have further discussion. Thank you.